Good morning. Hi, I'm Laura Zakowski, Vice Chair for Education, and I want to welcome you to Education Day. We're getting close to our 10th year, but I think it's actually maybe the ninth Education Day. I didn't really look back too closely. Oh, yes. Dr. Schnapp is going to introduce me while I took that away from me. <laughs> And what Dr. Schnapp was also going to say is today is Women Physicians Day. So it's wonderful to see all, everybody here today for that as well. So I want to thank a few uh, members of our offices who have really helped to make this Education Day work. Abby Rudzianis, Joe Orman, Tara Lusheen, and also Allison Ishitaki, our newest member of our, our second newest member of our education team. So thank you so much for doing all of this for us today. Uh, there is an agenda for Education Day out on the table if you didn't have the opportunity to grab one of those. And after today's Grand Rounds, Dr. Khaled is going to have discussion with us a little bit of how can we implement what we're hearing today at our institutions. So thank you for that. But I also want to introduce Dr. Callett. So thank you. Uh, she is the Stephen and Sheila Royal Endowed Chair and Director of the Robert D. and Patricia E. Kern Institute for Transformation of Medical Education at Medical College of Wisconsin. Whew, that is wonderful. <laughs> Long title, yes. Dr. Uh, Callett earned her MD at Mount Sinai and then completed her internship and residency at NYU Bellevue. She then moved to UNC where she completed a Bowen Brooks Fellowship followed by a Robert Wood Johnson Fellowship where she also earned her MPH. Prior to her current role as Professor of Medical Education at MCW, she was Professor of Medicine and Surgery at NYU. She's a general internist and medical education researcher. She has written extensively on communication skills, assessment, remediation, mentoring, professional identity formation, and character development in medical education. Wow, lots of good stuff. She has authored about 150 peer-reviewed publications. She has received many awards for excellence in medical education, most recently the National SGIM Career in Medical Education Award, and the Distinguished Teaching Award from AOA, which was student nominated. Dr. Khaled has been PI or co-PI on numerous grants and is currently the PI on a Jose M. Macy Jr. Foundation grant entitled Forming a Consortium to Assess, Prepare, and Support the Transition to Internship. Wow, how powerful. As the current director of the current institute, she leads her department to conduct innovations and scholarship in medical education, capacity building, and leadership training as well as providing funding for research and community engagement with transformative medical education. Dr. Kellett, we are so excited to have you here as an honored guest today at Education Day. Thank you. Armand. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Sikowski. That was a mouthful, I'm sorry, I apologize. You live long enough, you start to accumulate titles and you keep adding them on. Uh, as you can tell, I'm a busy, I'm busy. Um, very, I'm very grateful to be invited to Madison, to, to UW. Uh, I, as you heard, I just moved to Milwaukee from New York City uh, almost four years ago now, but COVID got a little bit in the way of me feeling like I'm, I'm on the ground and I appreciate uh, meeting the other medical school in the state <laughs> and having the opportunity today to interact with you. Um, is everybody online? I hear there's hundreds of people. And right, and hopefully they've all gotten the appropriate information so that I can move forward here. Let's see. Okay, Clint, nothing's moving. Clint's my guy. All right, like Eastwood. <laughs> all right, here we go. All right, I'm not going to read you this. Um, however, I am going to read you this. And um, I'm hoping to, in a relatively short period of time, do a 30,000 foot overview, sharing some of the work that I've done uh, uh, over the course of the last few years with colleagues all over the country. Um, and, and to just to be a little bit provocative and high level, and then we'll continue to talk at the end and, and later. Um, 
I was forced to put this in. I have no relationships with ineligible companies to disclose. However, I will disclose, this is selfless, tireless self-promotion that uh, I have written with co-authors, co-edited a couple of books. And most recently, the black and white ones are publications from our from the Kern Institute uh, at the Medical College of Wisconsin, which are compilations of essays that we've been writing weekly since uh, being scattered home for COVID starting in March, 2020. So I'll tell you a little bit about that later. Um, just a word about the Kern Institute. Again, I I'm obligated to say the whole name once, but I, I'm, I'm, I've, I've, I'm deferred to you, Robert D. and Patricia E. Kern Institute for the Transformation of Medical Education at the Medical College of Wisconsin. Our mission is to transform medical education to better align with the needs of the public on the basis of character, competence, and caring. And I'm happy to engage for the rest of the day if anybody wants more detail on that. We're very busy. This is how we work. Um, you know, our, we've gotten a generous gift from the Kern Family Foundation, which is a local Waukesha-based uh, foundation. Um, and we cultivate locally, disseminate globally. And our vision is all people have a relationship with a physician in a health system that supports equitable access to relationships and health with character and caring obvious to all. As you know, in our state, there are many underserved areas. I know that UW has had a long tradition of engaging medical education with underserved populations. Um, and we are trying to do that work as a, at a lar as large a scale as we can, given the generous gift from the Kern family. We do it in two ways. We want to make MCW an exemplar institution. We want the curriculum and the, in, and the culture and the learning environment to align with our mission. And we also give money away to establish collaboratories. This is, a, again, another unpaid announcement, uh, inviting our colleagues across the country and increasingly around the world to collaborate with other institutions, multi-institutional -institu collaborations to do work aligned with our mission. Um, and then we do a lot of dissemination. So here's my not learning objectives. And I'm a, as you've heard, as you heard the pedigree, I can write learning objectives. <laughs> But I decided to ask wicked questions instead. Um, and so here are the wicked questions, and hopefully we'll skate along the top of these. As I noticed, the beautiful lake with all this with all the skaters this morning, and I could not believe it. What is trust? Can we measure trust? Can the ability to engender trust be learned? And is entrustment an educationally sensitive patient outcome? Can we train people to engender trust? So hopefully by the end, we'll have asked all those questions and I've given, and given you a little bit of an example of what's possible. So just definitional, what is trust? Um, I would say, tell me if you agree or disagree with this. The public's trust in our profession has been declining since the early 1980s, the Pew Charitable Trust. And a lot of people have been monitoring that. It's not just us, all professions. Um, but there's a real decline, like a, a precipitous decline in what was traditionally a highly trusted profession. COVID has highlighted the fact that the profession's trust in the public has also been threatened. Um, where are my pictures? Oh, here we go. Uh, on the one hand, we have people, there's high profile refusal to align with what we believe is best practice. On the other hand, our healthcare professionals were put in danger without a guarantee of it, the minimally expected um, protections against, in this case, a pandemic virus. Uh, and as you know, we've lost some colleagues. Uh, I remember I from New York City, so I sat in Milwaukee and I watched what was going on with my colleagues. It took six or seven weeks for you know, the virus to really kind of hit our local community, but I was watching what was going on in, on the East Coast. Medical students were being graduated early all hands on deck, urologists were making rounds on pediatrics in the hospital. There was, we were serving and we were not guaranteed basic protection. So there's a, tr there's a trust challenge here. And I'll get to the, this at the end. That's my political announcement, but the, there, I believe there's a new social contract that is needed. And I'm not the only one, you know, there have been some good writing around this. And we're going to talk about how maybe we can meet the public's expectations, and we can invite them to meet ours as well. So what is trust? Uh, uh, the way we think about it is obviously the reliance on the character, ability, strength, or truth of someone or something. And then to end trust, and everybody in this room knows that language, that's not really a word in English. My word, my spell check keeps 
telling me not to use it, but but entrustment is kind of everywhere now around the way we think about competency-based medical education, outcomes-based medical education. And it really is to assign the responsibility to put something or someone you love into someone's care. Fair? That's kind of what we do as medical educators day in, day out. We don't watch them do it all. We, watch, we, do, we, we go out of our way to watch, but, but basically we're trusting them based on snippets of direct observation and some other understandings about who they are. So any medical students in the audience here? Residents, raise your hand. I am not meaning to be disrespectful, but from, the, from my mid sixties, I can tell you that you guys are looking a little young. And uh, that's just, this is just my, it's meant to be a joke, but I know it's, it, these are hard jokes to make right now. So one question we always ask ourselves in the hospital setting is, can I leave my resident alone to do this task? That's a day in, day out, multiple every day kind of question. People have studied this. Uh, and um, I'm just going to share, uh, read anything by Rose Hotla, uh, Schiffer Ginsburg, uh, Karen Hauer, and, you know, these are people from all over, from Canada and the U.S. They're really struggling with this question, and they've def defined what we do most of the time is called presumptive trust, based on the level of training or grounded in prolonged exposure, one or the other. Most of it is presumptive, based on level of training, Right. We just don't have enough data on our individual trainees to really make high quality trust decisions based on direct observations. This is just to remind you, I know you know this, it's an educator audience, but this is the typical learning curve. This is the, you could apply this to pretty much any kind of learning. It's always a, a, a curve, it's a curve. You start out not knowing anything, you're a novice for a while, you go into training, and then you have this precipitous kind of very steep learn part of the learning curve, and then you get out of training and then it flattens off. Fair? Clinical competence is developmental, we know that. We think of it, it's a smooth curve, but we think of it in stages. Those are arbitrary. And we base our trust decisions based on where people are and what we believe are these stages. We don't have a, a common understanding yet about this, but we're working toward it. And I would love to hear what's going on here. I'm sure there's, significant uh, work going on. The novice, advanced, competent, proficient, experienced, non-expert, that's a Dreyfus and Dreyfus. That's an old model. It's not from medicine, it's um, from training in general. And these competence thresholds, which are promotion moments, are based on decisions that we make, right? So not surprisingly, this is suggests that we're all on the same curve, but it's been demonstrated over and over again. We're not. Not everybody proceeds at the same pace. Uh, expertise is not guaranteed. So just uh, for those experienced, I, this is an internal medicine audience. These are, you're my people. There's things we do every day, all day long that we never get any better at. We're experienced non-experts. And everybody knows, because you've been reading the lay press and, and, and books for the lay public, that in order to really continue to gain expertise in this post-training era, you need to put deliberate effort and it's actually very effortful and it takes much longer than it did during the steeper parts of your learning curve. So you just have to do it on faith. Everybody agree? So they're really super that your, your, your best clinicians in your department are always learning. They're always asking for feedback. They're working hard to continue to develop expertise. You tend to only do that around selected things, not everything you do every day. So expertise is not guaranteed. If you don't do that work, you're not it doesn't happen. So here's the interesting thing is that these arbitrary threshold decisions, these decisions are made by us, right? They're faculty promotion, they're faculty de uh, defined promotion decisions that base basically on trust and a little bit of data about our trainees. Just to make a distinction uh, for those of you who scratch your head after you fill out all those forms, the ACGME and standards and, and EPAs and blah, blah, blah. These are not measurements, right? Measurements are objective and controvertible ratings. I'll tell you a little bit about how we make measurements, but what we're asking faculty to do is make judgments, right? Faculty are really bad at measurements. I'll tell you, you know this, but there's lots of data that suggests experienced clinicians are particularly bad at making these in objective and controvertible ratings. What we are really good at is making flexible decisions based on 
taking into account individual characteristics, the social context in which the assessment occurs. That's extraordinarily valuable, but it's not a measurement. It's a judgment. Um, so faculty judgments are highly context dependent and very idiosyncratic. Anybody ever look at it? Raise your hand if you ever looked at this literature or if you're ever trying to train faculty to do something in a yeah you know, with high inter-rater reliability. I gave up 25 years ago on trying to cha train my colleagues to make highly reliable ratings. We no longer do that. We ask, uh, I'll show you later, we ask our standardized patients to do that because those people you can train. Um, so, but the, this is this is why we disagree. We all have our own unique experience. Our, you know, we're experts. Uh, and so, but so that disagreement's not necessarily a bad thing. It may be a very good thing if we understand the source of those disagreements. So let me just give you, for those of you who are old enough to remember the Soviet judge, yeah, in the Olympics, it's where we're post-Soviet, but context and clinical case dependence might be really good, right? If you're a hepatologist or you're in a, you know, in a tertiary care environment versus a community clinic, those things matter in terms of your trust decisions. And so maybe the Soviet judge knows something that the other two don't, right? Maybe she's over, maybe she thinks the figures, she understands the figure skater and this is her best performance and whatever. She knows something about the context that the other judges don't. On the other hand, <laughs> unconscious bias, right? Context, understanding context is critical to judgment. On the other hand, bias, obviously, unconscious bias based on things that are not relevant to the decision you're making, obviously we need to eliminate. And so the sexist judge or the racist judge or the, whatever uh, is, is so, something we need to understand the source of those disagreements. And there's a lot of really good work on that by the same authors I told you, I named before. Um, I suggest you read everything um, and I'll show you a couple more. There's a difference though, between the way I'm using the word judgment and what we often talk about as non-judgmental ratings. I just wanna distinguish, it sounds like the same thing, but it's not. You wanna, non-judgmental means you're directing your critique at the behavior, not the fundamental integrity of the person. So I'm just, that's a, another paid announcement. Just to distinguish that for the trainees in the room, I know the, the experienced clinicians know that. Then there's everything else, noise, right? So we can, we can identify the source of agreements and Dix's disagreements, but as Daniel Kahneman, who wrote another 800 page book, right after Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow, which all of you have read cover to cover, right? Um, this book, which is got, getting a little bit less play, suggests that human judgment is very flawed. It's been shown over and over again. There's a lot of noise. There's relevant decision making. There's things that are relevant to your decision making. And then if you're hungry, tired, cranky, that all falls apart. And I suggest you read the book because I'm not going to summarize it for you. So Andrea Gindrich, who's the other author in this area, I recommend uh, you do some reading about, is that trustworthiness is a holistic social judgment based on impressions. We're not making measurements. Therefore, what does that mean? So trust is a judgment based on character and competence. And here's where my character, you know, at the current institute, we're all about character. I'll tell you a little bit about what we mean by that. But you know what this means if you think about it, that you get a sense of the person you're dealing with at a, at a level that's beyond their clinical competence that makes them more trustworthy versus others who might be just as clinically competent but are not as trustworthy. It's that je ne sais quoi, that other thing. So let me tell you how in the current institute we've been thinking about character, uh, character not, and character is another judgment. These are all um, what linguists call God terms. You know, those, those words that are universally perceived as positive. It's unless, unless you're talking about Disney characters who are also positive, you're, you're talking about something that's universally perceived as a good thing to have character. But we mean it more specifically, right? We mean the complex constellation of psychological characteristics that motivate, enable individuals to act as moral agents. The practice of medicine is a moral practice. Um, now I use the word moral and we could talk a little bit about that, but it is a practice that requires much, much more beyond high levels of competence, knowledge, and skills. Um, normally we call that attitudes, but it, that's not, I don't know if that's satisfying to you, but we're not talking, we're talking about well beyond what people's attitudes are. 
that it's developmentally dependent and contextually formed over time. It depends, like you, you can have very strong sense of your own character. You can be a very reliable, trustworthy person, and then it all falls apart under certain circumstances. And I'll show you some data about that. It manifests in dispositions and practices, which are influenced by situations and valued according to the so social context. Medical students can tell you about this as they rotate from clinical discipline to clinical discipline. The social context matters. What aspects of their character that are valued are different in different microcultures within our, within our world. And that philosophers call this virtues, right? So uh, sometimes we use the term virtues as well. And let me um, talk a little bit about that. We've been positively influenced by the positive psychology movement, which has given us a set of a lexicon, a set of la uh, some language to use to think about character strengths. That, that uh, research domain is very, very robust right now. And these character traits are being implemented as core educational objectives in K through 12 all over the world. So I, there's a lot of data. So, and, and this, there's, there's something called the VIA assessment. You can go online and sort of think about character traits, but this is what we mean by character. Philosophers call this virtues. Um, the, uh, our close colleagues in the UK at the University of Birmingham at the Jubilee Center have accumulated the world's evidence on this and uh, have a framework for human flourishing so that that is defined by a set of virtues, intellectual, civic, moral, performance strengths, and practical wisdom. Practical wisdom is the uber virtue. And let me, I'll define practical wisdom for the clinicians in the audience. It's doing the right thing for the right person at the right time for the right reasons. Does that sound like something we want? Yeah. It's, it's, we've been working on, you know, in our field, been working on versions of this, whether we call it clinical decision making, uh, clinical competence. It's not, it's a parallel idea. This is all educable, lots of data. Uh, we tend to focus in our field because we are more technical on the performance strengths. We talk a lot about motivation, perseverance, grit, resilience. That's, that's, the, that's the language we've been using lately. We tend to ignore the other virtue language, but I would recommend we start embracing it. And we do practical wisdom every day in every way, right? Practice, and for those of you who took a philosophy 101, that's phrenesis in Aristotelian uh, language. There's lots of words for that, but it's doing the right thing for the right person at the right time for the right reasons, consistently every day in every way. We have, we're an optimal performance profession. There's no, there's really no room for error, although we make errors all the time. Um, so this is not a bad model for us. And I'm going to tell you that I believe this is an adaptive expertise. This is, again, you have to be very, you have to be dancing all the time. You make, a, you consult with your, with your colleagues in another clinical discipline. You might have to demonstrate different characters, right? Your practical wisdom might be when you talk to the emergency room that you're going to do it in a certain way, not in other ways. And this is in every day in every way, we're sort of talking about our practical wisdom. So just to go back to Aristotle and many, many, many other philosophers, by the way, but we just like to go back. Um, it's, uh, Aristotle basically thought that practical wisdom is the combination of the moral will and the moral skill to do the right thing for the right person at the right time for the right reason. So it's will and skill. Skills we can see and observe. We're actually quite good at measuring skills these days. We're much better than we were 30 years ago. Moral will, that's something... <laughs> That's the character. Those are the character traits. Um, this is what our, our community, raise your hand if you've seen this. Everybody see this? Does this look a little mechanical and technical to you? I, I find this a lot. I love these people. By the way, these are uh, the, the authors of this particular book that was published by the AMA most recently um, are close colleagues of mine. But I hate this image. Anybody else have a feeling? Uh, I know, we'll talk later. It's all true. It's all based on very rigorous cognitive psychology, but we're emerging from that era where the human brain has been perceived as a kind of machine and you write the code and there's AI and everything kind of works out predictably as in a predictive probability way as you would. If you do all the right things, you get the right outcome, right? Something's missing from this model. And I've, I've debated over 
beers with these folks. Um, and I think what that something is, is the practical wisdom bit that, that, integ that integrates. And so we're in the, in the current institute working on a model where we're basically saying there's two things. And here we call it moral content and moral capacity, but basically it's uh, the psychology of reasoning and decision-making and wisdom versus the philosophy. And I have four philosophers in my institute. It took me three and a half years to figure out what to do with them, but this is, I put them to work on this. They're wonderful, deeply thoughtful, very rigorous scholars that go well beyond what we do in medical education research. And, and I think we need that. And so we're working on, how do you get wise clinical action? You gotta do it all. You can't just pay attention just to the gears in the brain of the individual trainee. Um, all right, I'm gonna change I'm going to change for a moment and say, uh, as as you when you introduce me, I have a grant from the Macy Foundation to form a consortium around our uh, project. I'm going to tell you a little bit about where where I think the answer to this is yes. So Night on Call uh, was designed seven years, seven eight years ago now. Uh, it's a comprehensive four hour simulation. There's four clinical cases. Uh, it was designed to measure all the core EPAs for res res readiness for residency as defined by the AAMC. National consensus on what we want to do, the outcomes of medical school, the undifferentiated physician. Um, and it was designed to, we actually delivered night on call. It's very comprehensive and fun. You know, students put on their white coat. We tell them you're interns. They're two weeks to three months. Uh, it's two weeks to three months before graduation. They're contractually obligated to residency and the residencies are contractually obligated to them. There's no high stakes decision-making here. They're going. The question is how ready are they to go? Um, so as I said, these are, if you haven't seen them, the WMC, these are nothing controversial here about what we expect our graduates to be able to do unsupervised on day one of, of internship. Uh, as I told you, it's a it's a circuit, right? They get four. It, the, the initial version was four hours. We have it down to three. Uh, there's standard coverage. It's immersive. We tell them it's nighttime. The nurse calls, talk to the nurse, get the information, meet the nurse in the patient's room, talk to the patient, interact with the nurse, assess the patient. This is coverage, not comprehensive, right? They're doing, you know, patients stop making urine last, you know, in the last shift come and, and then you can pass a Foley, you can start an IV that don't technically actually do those things, but the you can ask the nurse to do those things. She gives you clinical information in response. You step out of the room, you write a clinical coverage note, you call the attending in the middle of the night. Does that ever happen anymore? It happens still. In the middle of the night, you say, you know, Mrs. So-and-so's post-op, you know, six hours, uh, stop making urine, here's what I think. and and on and on and on, cycle, cycle, cycle. Then you hand off the four cases to the oncoming intern. 14 individuals assess the competence of that student going through this 14 different 360s, right? The nurses, the patients, the patient's family, the attending on the phone, the colleague taking, cover, okay, taking the handover, and uh, a few other things to measure all 13 core EPAs. Get the situation? Basically, okay. Sorry for the medical students and residents here. I know we torture you with these things, but but our students actually enjoy this because it's low stakes. And, and um, it's also, we prepare them with these modules that prepare them for the clinical cases. So they're not unaware of what to expect. Um, they enjoy this because they get a, we debrief immediately and they get immediate feedback. We, we built an app to kind of collect the data, analyze the data and spit it back to them within a within we're we're down to immediate if we can get some of our tendings to do their work quickly if we can't get them to do it then it takes a few hours um we measure competencies and epas this is just a, and we also ask every one of the observers and the, these are the competencies check 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 right across the 13 core epas we also ask every observer to make an entrustment judgment and we ask it in, in relevant ways, right? So for the attending, we say, would you trust this intern to take care of the next patient unsupervised, uh, you know, down to, I, I, like this kid needs to go back to medical school. 
Um, and then the, from the patient perspective, the family's perspective, it's more like, would you recommend, would you see this doctor again? Would you recommend this doctor to someone else? So we ask the trust question in different ways. So we have a lot of measurements. So let me just show you, not surprisingly, right? Competency and uh, trust correlate. Not perfectly. It's about 0.4-ish, which is in social science world is a high correlation. But there's clearly a tracking, right? You have to be competent to be trustworthy <laughs> at some level. Uh, we, we measured this. This is, this is just the measurements we used from the different perspectives. If, for those of you who know what a confirmatory factor analysis looks like, we have very good uh, characteristics that suggest that there's an underlying um, an underlying variable called entrustment that everybody who sees this one individual agrees on. There's something about this student, this one person that is seen by everybody who they interacted with through this four hours as trustworthy. Um, just to give you a little bit more detail about that, the standardized patient, the standardized nurse in the same room seeing the same performance on the, by the trainee agrees about point to point 0.5. That's actually very high <laughs> agreement. Um, they're in the same room watching the same performance. The standardized patient, standardized nurse who are not, uh, standardized attending who's on the call, who's on the phone, agree to point 0.2 to point 0.3. Also pretty good. But you know, the oral presentation isn't a performance in the room, right? So some, some of our trainees are much better or worse at presenting and discussing cases than they are at actually interacting with the patient. So that makes sense. Um, so these, this is the summary, right? You, if you, it's actually, you agree on entrustment if you're watching the same performance together at a relatively high level, it kind of dissipates. So if you're not in the same room, but there's still correlation, it's distributionally similar. So based on this, I would say, that entrustment, and I know this is a, for, anyway, entrustment is a measurable social construct. It is what we say it is. Entrustment is, there's no like, you know, truth about entrustment. Entrustment is what we all agree on is trustworthy and it's measurable. So did I, did I convince you yet? Yeah. Okay. Um, just to show you a little bit more data, this is really fun. Every line on this heat map is an individual student. Every column is that they're moving through night on call, left to right. Um, the, there is, you know, it's stoplight. So red is bad, green is good. And this is just the same, the first case, right? The first column is the patient. The second column is the nurse. The third column is the attending. See who's the most um, concerned about the trustworthiness of our near graduates? the nurses. And these are, some of them are real, are nursing students trained to play nurses, but they all have some clinical sort of experience. They're not actual functioning experienced nurses, but these are not actors. These are folks we train to play the nurse. So interesting, right? I, it interests me. Um, but then we, then we train them. We make them sit in front of a wise on call module to learn the content and actually things get better. The nurses find them a little bit more trustworthy. In the wise on call module, there's some stuff about communication with inter interprofessional communication, but also core content about oliguria in this case, right? Uh, low urine output. So we've also demonstrated that you can teach them within the context of this, you can prove trustworthiness if you know what, they're, what the observers are looking for. So I would say that entrustment is measurable, <laughs> probably educable, maybe, and that entrustment is an educationally sensitive patient outcome. And here's where I'm going to take you through just a high level. As you, as you know from my introduction, I am a medical education researcher. I'm actually a quant. I, I have a MPA, I have a public health degree in epidemiology and biostats, which is why I'm measuring things. Um, so in the not so distant past, Medical education research was a multidisciplinary field of scientific investigation that studies how the structures, process of learning, and individual characters of learners, and the instructional design affects individual learning outcomes. Sound right to those folks who are trying to struggle with doing scholarship in this domain? Is that enough? Will this transform what we do in medical education and health? I would say it depends, right? 
And um, let's not go. Oh, here we go. It depends on whether we can link what we're studying to what really matters, <laughs> right? The impact of this learning on safety, effectiveness, efficiency, and patient centeredness of care, ultimately provided by those trainees who demonstrate they can learn in the in the environment. And this is a big challenge. And I know people in the room who try to do this work will say, but, but, but NIH doesn't fund this. Um, and I'm saying this, it's going to sound self-serving, but I haven't, I got an R01 from the NIH to study medical education. It is possible. It was a negative trial <laughs> and I never got another one, but uh, <laughs> I try, I tried, but I tried, but we did come up with this concept of educationally sensitive patient outcomes. Now, you know this, not all patient outcomes are sensitive to what we do, right? As a matter of fact, we have a very limited piece of the pie. Health and patient outcomes, even in, in, in the care systems we're in, are not directly related to anything we do in medical education. We have about, I'd say, 20% of the pie if we're, if we're very define it very broadly. Um, but that's a, that's a big piece. And if we could leverage that piece, uh, it would matter to patients. So we've defined educationally sensitive patient outcomes as those outcomes that are likely to be sensitive to clinician skill can be measured and will have in, influence on, on outcomes as far as we know. And, and we published a paper a long time ago now, 2010, proposing a conceptual framework for that work. Um, and here's the basic idea, right? Training physicians to do something, like let's say activate the clinical microsystem for those health system science people in the room, you, you'll like this. Clinical microsystem is that small group of interprofessional people who take care of patients. If we can train our trainees, our junior colleagues, to, to be maximally effective in that environment, we know better outcomes ensue. We know that from other data, from lots of data. Uh, we know if you can activate the individual patient in their own self-care, outcomes are better. And we also know that if you can make sure patients are literate, right, health literacy, we have good data from lots of studies over decades and decades that important outcomes are improved. Those are them, right? So patients who are engaged in shared decision-making and management of their health with sustained behavior change, all those outcomes have been measurably improved. Quality, safety, bio biological outcomes, functional status, and quality of life. What's our piece of this? <laughs> That's the big box across the top. Can we educate people? Those are the, educa the education, the ESPOs, educationally sensitive patient outcomes. There are many, many of these probably. These are the ones we're working toward, and I'll show you a little bit more about what we're working on. If you can maximize health for the for patients through these outcomes, then it should inform what we do in ed medical education, right? And it should be a virtuous cycle of, of, of better outcomes. So we built an educational uh, data unit. We think of it as a, uh, medical education as a translational science, right? Not bench to bedside, but learning lab to bedside. But it's a parallel idea. This lab looks a lot like your Sim Center or whatever, your standardized patient program. We have a very robust standardized patient program. Um, where we do lots and lots of performance-based assessment and give lots and lots of feedback. We have many, many cases. It's in integrated across the whole UME curriculum and our GME, this is at NYU, our GME curr curriculum increasingly, many, many GME programs. So learners often say, but that's not how I am with real patients. Anybody ever hear that? Do they think they're better or worse? Better they think they're better with real patients. So it turns out you can study that, <laughs> uh, and this is how you do it, right? You use the same cases, you, you control for case variability content. You might even use the same people, the standardized patients. The, and, wow, this is done in New York City, lots of out-of-work actors. We have very, very, this is very good work for actors, and they really enjoy doing this work. It's meaningful. They feel it's purposeful. And they can do standardized performance like no, you know, if you've ever watched a standardized patient, it's amazing. Same patient, 60 times a day, day after day. They can also be trained to be highly reliable, uh, reliable raters. If, if you train them, you have to do some training, but on behaviorally specific outcomes. We take those people and we send them into clinic. And believe it or not, the healthcare systems like this. The VA does this and our, and our private healthcare system 
we'll do this because the data, because these people have the patient experience. They get an MR number, they have to register, they have to check in, they have to be seen by the healthcare team, they get seen by the doctor, then they're sent outside to follow up. They have the whole experience of patient, the patient experience. So we've been able to do this project because we've convinced the healthcare systems they will get the data they want and we'll get the data we want. And in fact, the, the, the cost of, you know, taking up care slots, which everybody goes, but, you know, I'm not going to produce enough patient care visits, uh, gets, uh, is washed out by all this. So I'm, uh, it's not, a, this is not for the faint of heart, but if you want to do it, I, I have, I, I can tell you who to talk to. Um, those standardized patients, as I said, they have the whole experience. They provide checklist data like they would in an OSCE center, same data. The data we're most familiar with is the communication skills. So I'm gonna share that, but they collect a whole host of clinical performance data. So if you can do this, here's what you, here's, this is, by the way, this is real data. Um, I'm, I'm sharing it with you. We have not published this because we're not absolutely certain about every data point. So this is just to show you what's potentially possible. There are 14 measures here. The first 11 are UME. The second 11 after the green uh, line are GME, because some of our students stay with us and start seeing patients in clinic. So we can follow them all the way into practice. Um, it gets, there's fewer and fewer, right? So there's a numbers problem here. There's multiple measures using the same instruments around the core clinical competence. And in this case, this is all communication skills. The orange line is a single individual. The black line is the cohort at each point her cohort, that her or his co cohort at that point. So, you know, it's a pretty strong student, right? Better than average. What happens in, uh, oh, that's you and me, I told you that, that's GME, whoops. I'm gonna go back for a second. What happens in that first, first, the first day after the green line? That's the PGY1 day. Ooh. Interpretations? <laughs> huh? Yeah, something. The context, the, the context changes dramatically, right? The level of responsibility, the terror, the, the complexity, everything changes. And a, a perfectly competent young person, right? Very competent. In fact, better than, than average becomes less so for a short period of time, which is residency, <laughs> all of residency. <laughs> And then by PGY two and three, and this is, I'm, I'm laughing because we, we sometimes think, you know, our residents, we, we select these wonderful people and then they can't communicate with patients or they get into trouble in the clinical environment or the nurses complain or, and we're wondering what's happening. So we know they're competent, they're capable. The question is, they, can they manage the transitions, right? And this is, there's a lot of research going on around that, but look what happens at the very end in real clinical encounters. By the way, are all our residents sign consent? For this, but this is a IRB approved project. It's not, they know they're going to see an unannounced serious patient. They, they're not told which patient. They think they know sometimes, but they're wrong. Uh, there's a detection rate of about 15% that they really can detect. And it's just because they talk to each other and they realize, uh oh, or the, uh, the preceptor um, inadvertently um, lets it be known. But basically, look what happens, right? They're better off at the end than they were at the beginning by a significant, by 20, 30 percentage points on a very highly reliable scale. That's about what we can expect for the first phase of training, right? It's if you keep working on your communication skills, you become an expert, but we wouldn't expect, there's no ceiling effect here. You see that? There's still room for growth. Um, so that's what's possible. And then of course, uh, we can connect those kinds of measures with, with patient outcomes trust by the patient, entrustment from the profession, blood pressure, blood sugar, whatever is relevant to the, and you know, all our students go off into different disciplines. It becomes much more complex, but um, I would say, and we've done a little, by the way, I've, we've done a little bit of that work. It's very difficult because we're talking about very small numbers at the end there, but um, entrustment is an educationally sensitive outcome. I believe it's likely to be sensitive to learnable clinician skills. We've already demonstrated that we can teach people to do the clinical communication skills that we're measuring here. It can be measured and it probably has very significant influence on patient outcomes. So will this transform medical education? Uh, maybe. <laughs> 
uh, you know, you're only, you know, that whole finding your keys under the light uh, uh, metaphor, that's, you know, we can only see what we can, what we are paying attention to, what we're measuring. We're still, the system is evolving very rapidly. It's very chaotic. Things like pandemics happen or political unrest or all kinds of things that will potentially undo this. But trust is the foundation of that social contract. And it's a major goal. Of, it's like any definition of the goal of medical education. We would be disappointed if it didn't include this. Um, and the danger, of course, is we're not looking at the things. We're not measuring the things that um, might be important components of this. And that's my challenge to this audience. Um, join us in that. It's a life's work, as they like to say. And, and my life is, um, I'm done. Um, so just to get back to the social contract idea, I think, you know, again, our experience with COVID, I'm sure your experience with COVID is we served. People came out, people worked. My brother is an emergency room nurse in New Jersey. That was the very beginning of that, of the, of the epidemic. Every day, all the time. He looked like the woman in the top corner there at the end of the day because of all the, all the personal, uh, the PP, you know what I mean? Um, and, uh, the medical students were there. Our NYU medical students graduated early, about 40, 50% of the class that happened up and down the East coast. Didn't have to happen here because of the timing, but they graduated early. They weren't ready. The system absorbed them and they were ready. Right. So it, the transition was a, you know, we all, everybody came together. It was really very impressive. People wrote incredibly you know, moving pieces in the newspaper about how it's incredible what nurses and doctors and respiratory therapists and, and food service people are doing, essential workers. So check. Under those conditions, uh, we serve. The question is, you know, what's the negotiation here? And for those of you who are philosophically oriented, I'm happy to talk over lunch about this. But, you know, there are components of the social contract that uh, based that that go both ways. And I think we need to advocate for our own moral agency to do right to to do what we do well, <laughs> and to do it with a little less constraint than maybe the systems want us to have. We want to build our the our our own ability to do to 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 build good strong relationships. We want respect for our expertise. Uh, we want respect for our personhood and our protection from biases and prejudices, freedom to speak out for our own patients, all kinds of things that we could make a long list of about the social contract that I think is is worthy to do, is based on trust and entrustment. I think we're we're doing our end. We're measuring trustable professional activities, even though we don't the word's not in, in ordinary English yet. And um, I guess I think I will leave you with this, which is, Hopefully we've talked a little bit about what is trust. Hopefully I've suggested that while we don't do it every day in every way in every place, we can measure trust, trustworthiness. Uh, we can probably engender that. Otherwise, why are we in the education business, right? If we, if we don't believe that we can educate people to be trustworthy physicians, why are we here? And that I think probably entrustment is an educationally sensitive patient outcome. And with that, I'll... Uh, leave it to whoever's going to do the Q and A. Yeah. Thanks so much, Dr. Collette. What in, uh, interesting questions and ideas and thoughts and things we're trying to maybe start here a little bit, but love your expertise in this area. I'm looking at the audience. Any questions in the audience? We certainly have some online. Okay, Dr. Seibert. Dr. Schnapp to Dr. Seibert. Oh, I'll ask first because... <laughs> so thank you for a wonderful talk. And I was reflecting back on your slide where you had the practical wisdom and um, those four columns. And I'm you focused on teaching. My question is, can you or or should we be thinking about those those areas when we are selecting our residents or medical students, how do we incorporate that into our um, selection and uh, interview process? Yeah, really, really good question. Because by 24 years old, a lot of these things are well, well, 2024. 20, who's who's on admissions? Who's on the admissions committee? 
We have a dean of admissions in the, in the audience? Residency selection. Residency selection, okay. Residency is a whole different level, right? Because it's four years later for most of us. Um, that's the obvious question. Selection is critical because we're talking about adults. I would say we should be using these characters. Does, does uh, UW have an MMI, a multiple mini interview? Do you, anybody know? No? So we know uh, this is just, this is a joke. And I know for the program directors in the audience, I apologize, but individual interviews are very biased and actually aren't nearly as trustworthy in making good selections as we, we wish them to be. So there are strategies that like a more consistent, like an OSCE, you know, sort of a little bit, uh, multiple mini interviews. Although you don't have to be as rigorous in OS as an OSCE, by the way, that provides you with prediction Predict, prediction regarding particularly trustworthiness, ethical reasoning, um, and trustworthiness, partly because in an MMI, if you do it right, the um, the interviewers, and these are brief interviews, right? It's a series of very 10-minute interviews, and there's a, a single score from each interview, and it gets summed, it gets averaged, and that goes into your admissions decision. It's not all physicians asking the questions. So often, you almost always have you know members of the staff, colleagues, residents, and students, you have social workers and people who can make, so it's a, it's a more holistic, so I would say there's a lot of work over decades and decades of trying to do measures of character, personality traits, and then MBTIs that is, we've experimented with a lot of things in admissions, none of those things are useful, and then uh, the MMI is the only thing that has predictive capacity. So I would say the answer is absolutely yes, because you don't want to start in residency program directors. Raise your hand. You spend 80% of your time with 20% of your trainees, correct? The ones who are challenging. I don't believe, and that's the remediation talk later. If anybody uh, I, you know, remember I showed you what happened to that very competent young person, right? So it's not that they're characterologically flawed, uh, although every once in a while, but very rarely, it's character strength issues almost always. And uh, hopefully, luckily they're educable, even adults. Uh, so, you know, with the right systems in place, you can usually, most people can be professional. So that's, that's my answer to you. The answer is yes, we should do a better job in admissions. No, we can't predict it's not perfect, but we could do things that are better versus things that are very, take a lot of effort and don't provide much value. Thank you. Um, I'm Christy Seibert. I'm one of the folks in the Dean's office here for undergraduate medical education. And so my question comes a bit from that. Um, while I completely agree work-based, um, you know, play work, place, place, place assessment. assessments. Yeah. Um, you know, it's kind of the Holy grail. Yeah. Uh, we rely a lot in undergraduate medical education on OSCEs on performative yeah. and we're super lucky here. Every single one of our courses has multi-station OSCE. Our students go through at least 40 stations of OSCEs of observations with trained observers before they graduate. So I feel super comfortable that our graduates as best as we can tell, are ready to go yeah. and are competent. Yes. Um, step two CS was disbanded recently, um, in large part because of very successful lobbying by medical students about cost and uh, real issues of um, burden. Yes. Travel burden, financial Travel burden, yeah. other types of things. So very real issues. I'm not you know, saying that that Hit, wasn't the, valid. The hidden tuition. Right. Everybody hear that, right? There's been a, a few good papers about that. So while I can say with certainty that our students graduating are competent, there are many medical schools that don't even approach what we have here. And I've just sat at national meetings where now individual medical schools are coming together and basically trying to come up with their own step two CS, which seems like a ridiculous waste of resources. So I'm curious if you could comment about kind of the, the idea of a nationalized, you talk about this, you know, maybe um, the, the program you do at NYU. I don't call project, right. You know, uh, you know, are we all really going to be obligated to do that, to certify, to bless people as we hand them over? 
um, whatever that is, uh, you know, and, yeah. and is that really going to be a standard? I think we can we can easily meet that standard. But there's many schools, many new schools, many under resourced schools, many schools that have missions that are really important that don't have the money to do this. So you guys know, and I, I don't know how you feel about this, that MCW has two regional campuses, Wausau and Green Bay. You know that, okay. I didn't know how you, people feel. I, I'm new to the area, so <laughs> I don't know the politics of this. They're three-year schools. They're mission-based, 40 kids in the class. They do not have the resources to do any of this. They, uh, they just were not given those resources. We do the Night on Call project with six now now eight schools the macy foundation funded us to build a consortium and we have a consortium of six schools and we and including those two campuses and we've just expanded dramatically and the reason is what you say not that we want to replace step two cs because that happened like last year like that wasn't the goal but because these small under-resourced mission-oriented schools needed help we can now deliver night on call virtually because COVID helped us do that. And so there's there are opportunities. So that's that's a paid announcement. Um, the answer to your question is UW, big public institution, lots of resources. I know it doesn't feel that way, but <laughs> uh, uh, you have 40, you know, you, you have the capacity to do this. My question is, are you using research rigorous measures? <laughs> And just make sure, right? That's what I tell people at big ASCII programs because they're great as long as you're doing it right. If you're not doing it right, you're spending a lot of money, your students don't like it, and you're not learning anything. Um, medical students did lobby against Step 2 CS. I felt, I, I feel sad about that personally because I believe that that was important because it drove us as medical educators to focus on some things we needed to focus on that we were not preparing our students to do before. CS. So there, I don't, the measure itself, like um, they didn't fail enough people to make it worth it, but the motivation to these, to, the, to us was critical. It changed everything. If you live through that era, you know, so, you know, a yes, we need to do something probably. And I don't, I like not on call because it's meaningful. Like it's deep, it's meaningful. It measures, by the way, we give students six, seven, eight page reports on the details of feedback. We ask them to write learning goals for their transition. We haven't yet failed anybody based on, you know, we, they have to go because they're contractually required, but we haven't, we haven't given program directors that information. That's always a question, by the way, it's always a question. You want it. I know you want it. Uh, but we, we're not there yet, but that's the research question, right? Can we do that in a way that smooths the transition that protects patients from that transition, the, the detuning that some of our most competent students have initially. So it's not a, it, I think you have, I think we're ready for a really good continuum, you and me to GME based on all that measure. There's a hand in the back there. Well, we'll do one from um, oh, online. Right, we have people online. Yeah. Yes. So um, there's a question about the unannounced standardized patient. Yeah. Um, it's coming. It feels a little bit ethically murky from the clinician's perspective, and yes. even from the perspective of cl the clinician's other patients. Yeah. Can you elaborate or comment on that? Yes. Uh, it feels ethically murky, as when you first think about it. So we have spent years. We have. We have our internal research ethics approval to do this. We have written consent from anybody who would engage with an unannounced steroids patient. As I told you, the healthcare system, the microsystems get a lot of value because they get real patient engagement data that actually is very difficult to get, right? If you if you've, you work in systems, you know that to get really high quality patient engagement data, patient experience data, so we, the people in hospital systems and healthcare systems are actually happy with this. On average, our, th our residence is a three-year residency. On average, they see four unannounced standardized patients over three years in their clinic. So you can do the math. <laughs> it might affect the bottom line and access to care for other patients. But for those of you who work in resident clinics, uh, that feels manageable, right? Four patients over three years, there's a no-show rate, you can, right? So there is, and, and again, remember the, the trainees and, and, and we do this with, with students and with attendings, 
everybody has given consent. Uh, I mean, not that everybody consents, but anybody who sees an unannounced standardized patient has given written consent. So we try to make it very high value to trade off the feeling that it it might compete with real patient care. Thanks, Shobi. Thank you so much for that. Um, I appreciated early on, there was a slide um, thinking about bias. Yeah. Thinking about bias, thinking about unconscious bias. Super appreciate the construct of 360s so that it's not only the physician view of the trainee, but a, a much more diverse view. My question is around gender, race, ethnicity, concordance, um, and when I think about the systems that we have in place that I have been proud of for so long, I now really question our system yeah. around that. You and the rest of us, right? So it's it's come into the zeitgeist of, the, of our consciousness that we have to pay more attention to this. There's been work going on for decades, but as you say, it's, it's, it's urgent now. Um, night on call, that particular experience, and our, we're in New York City, it's a very diverse city. It's easy for us to recruit standardized patients that reflect patient populations. And we are explicitly do that. So that, you know, first layer, it's not true for our friends in Wausau and Green Bay. However, they have a diversity there that they can then address. So it's flexible enough so that the patients can be diverse. That's one, one land. There's not, it's, it's not a high enough N, the sample size isn't high enough to really look in detail at things like bias and, but we know it exists so we can kind of build it into cases. The Macy Foundation, everybody know the Josiah P. Macy, Macy Foundation, one of the only funders of medical education research in the country, except for Stemlar, the MVME, um, their priorities, and we had to meet those priorities, were around diversity and bias and other ethical challenges. So we intentionally in Night on Call have developed cases. And we're working with uh, Christina Gonzalez and some other people in the, in the general medicine world that, that look at measuring unconscious bias in clinical decision-making to build those cases. So just if that reassures you, um, we're trying, but I think we're, we've got work to do. Thank you so much. Such wonderful questions. Thank you so much. We do have the opportunity to spend some further time with Dr. Collette here in this room. We'll take a few minutes stretch break. We can start again at 9.07 and we can have a discussion together more about these issues. Thank you everyone for being here.